Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Waves, yes. Thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Becca Warwick, and I'm an intern with the Montana World Affairs Council, and we are excited to have you all with us this morning. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to thank the council and the classroom sponsors, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, BNSF Railway Foundation, the Mansfield Center, First Security Bank, and Trail West Bank. Philip Un is currently Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Plough Shares Fund. Prior to joining Plough Shares Fund, he was Vice President at the Asia Foundation, a Pantech Scholar in the Korean Studies, in Korean Studies at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University, and the Vice President at the private equity firm of H&Q Asia Pacific. Dr. Un's writings and commentary have appeared on CNN, The Hill, ForeignPolicy.com, APTV, Fox News, National Public Radio, NBC, U.S. News, and World Report, and the Los Angeles Times, among others. He is also a co-editor editor of a book titled North Korea and Beyond. We are very lucky to have him with us this morning, and he has a lot of extensive first-hand experience dealing with the, this topic that we'll be discussing this morning. So it's my pleasure to now turn it over to Dr. Yoon. Oh, thank you. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Everyone, you can just nod your heads. Okay, great. So um, let me tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, what I'm going to do is start off with a little introduction about why North Korea matters, why you should care about it. The second thing is when I'm on news uh, and when I talk with reporters, they're always asking me two questions. First question is, what is the real threat? What should we be worried about? And the second question is, why is North Korea doing what it's doing? You know, why do they want nuclear weapons? So I'll cover those relatively quickly. And then what I wanted to do is go over, based on sort of my experience over the last 25 years dealing with North Korea, some tips and um, uh, facts for you to keep in the back of your mind. North Korea is going to be in the news for quite a while. And so part of what you're learning in school right now is how to become a critical thinker. Um, and the idea is not to believe everything that you hear. And so, but be, to be able to do that, you have to understand, sort of have some basic knowledge. And so what I'm going to give you are basically five sort of uh, myths or tips or things to be thinking about whenever you hear somebody talking about North Korea. So those are the three things that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And just want to be very clear, we'll try to do this, you know, in about 30 minutes or so, if that's okay. Yes. All right. So first thing, I'm uh, Executive Director of Plowshares Fund. Uh, we're a public foundation. We give away money to reduce and eliminate the threats of nuclear weapons. That's what we do. We've given away something like $110 million over the last 30 years to 1,000 uh, grantees and organizations. And in fact, we fu uh, uh, funded very early funding for four Nobel Peace Prize winners, the most recent one. The International Campaign to Ban Nuclear Weapons. They won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, and we're an early funder for them. So we do what's called venture philanthropy, the idea of small amounts of money for a really good idea to see if it can take off. So I have a question for you. How many nuclear weapons do you think there are in the world right now? Any idea? Let's go through each of our schools, and we'll have each school give a guess. A guess. Yep. Can we start with Sealy Lake, please? Any number. So what do you think? A million. Oh, 200, 230? A million. A million. Okay. Somewhere between 230 and a million. Okay, that's pretty like. good. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's so funny because I asked some other people and they said, oh, maybe 50. Okay, right now there are 14,500 nuclear weapons in the world. Now, the high... Uh, at some point during the 1980s was 70,000 nuclear weapons, all right? Now, in Montana itself, there are 150 nuclear weapons. All right, now, everyone knows Hiroshima, right? Hiroshima. <laughs> did you see there? Did, just, did, did you see? There was some surprise. Okay, I think there people, was some surprise okay. with that. 150 yeah. nuclear weapons here in Montana. Now, do people know what Hiroshima is, right? Yes? No? First nuclear weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan, that had a total, let me just say, I'll give you a number, 15 kilotons. That was the explosive power of that weapon to level the city. 
That 15 kilotons is enough to destroy half of Manhattan Island in New York. Just think about that, 15 kilotons, all right? One weapon. Now, here in, Bo here in Montana, you have somewhere 150 nuclear, nuclear weapons. One of those weapons has the po explosive power of 300, and 300 kilotons. In other words, one of those weapons has enough power to destroy basically 15 Manhattans in one fell swoop in seconds. We're talking about an enormous amount of power. And that's not the biggest bomb we've got. We've got other bombs that are actually 100 times more than what fell on Hiroshima. Okay? So this is the kind of thing we're dealing with. All right? So why is North Korea important? Okay. First thing we talked about, everyone knows about the nuclear weapons. Okay? Uh, the second thing is the missiles. They have the capability of basically putting a nuclear weapon on top of a missile and it coming and hitting the United States, South Korea, Japan, all of our allies. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing that we have to worry about or we think about or why it's important, all right, is that they are known to be trafficking drugs and counterfeit money. So there's a crime related to that. The other thing that we have is human rights. North Korea has this atrocious human rights record, and we believe there's something like 200,000 people in concentration camps um, that are there because of their political beliefs. And some of them, as has been documented by the UN, have been subject to torture, rape, even murder as a result of them being there. That's something that is going to happen. We will find out how actually how bad it is at some point in the future, but me as a Korean American and someone as a part of humanity, I'm going to be asked by my children and perhaps my grandchildren, what were you doing when all these terrible things were going on? And so this is something we all have to ask ourselves, and that's why North Korea matters, okay? So you get a sense of what it is that we're talking about here, okay? So that, in my mind, are the reasons why, and the other piece of this is if North Korea gets a nuclear weapon, then it's possible that South Korea will want a nuclear weapon, Japan will want a nuclear weapon, and uh, uh, Taiwan will want a nuclear, nuclear weapon, and then China will increase its nuclear weapons, okay? So we have another arms race. Arms races are expensive and they're dangerous, okay? Now, let's go to the second section. Yeah, okay, well, I questions? wonder if we should, yeah, let's pause and see if anybody has some questions. That's a big, that's a lot of information to take in, and I'm sure there's yeah. some thoughts around that. Um, Fraser, was that a hand that I saw in Fraser? Questions? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We definitely have one down at Soldatna. Soldatna, would you like to go ahead and start us off? So, Xander. Hi, my name is Xander. And uh, what's one of the things that made you like want to take initiative and want to change and like want to go in and try and help this? Well, for me personally, on North Korea, my parents, I'm Korean American. My mom is, was born in what is North Korea. My dad is what is born in, was born in what is now South Korea. And so for me, it was a personal issue of wanting to uh, prevent another war on the Korean Peninsula. You know, um, you know, thou, you know uh, there's so many casualties. The country was destroyed. And I was worried that if we didn't watch out, we could have another potential war on the Korean Peninsula. And quite frankly, that was what I was worried about last year, that, that some kind of miscalculation would occur on the peninsula. So uh, I also believe that nuclear weapons as a general thing, while they had their place in you know, an earlier time, um, I believe uh, that they are really a liability and not an asset anymore. And you don't have to take my word for it. You have uh, four people, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, former Senator Sam Nunn, former Secretary of State George Shultz, and former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who were all Cold War warriors who now say that nuclear weapons are a liability asset, we need to get rid of these, and they're both Repu two Democrats and two Republicans. And so from my standpoint, this is something that we, that the fewer there are, the better. And so this is what we're trying to do. You know, I have a great, uh, you know, my, I've got a great job because every day I'm going to work trying to make the world a safer place in a very concrete way. Mm, thank thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Soldana. Uh, Celia, I see a hand there. And then we'll go Seely, and then Fraser, you're you're after Seely. Um, so 
Do you think North Korea will ever get rid of their... Get rid of the nuclear weapons? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll answer that a little bit later, but let me tell you the short answer. The short answer is I don't know, okay? And I'll tell you why, all right? One of the things that I'm going to tell you later on, but this is a good time for me to just go ahead and tell you, is that one thing that you've got to keep in mind is that no one, when it comes to North Korea's leadership, no one really knows what's going on. You're going to hear a lot of news where you got some experts like me who are saying, well, North Korea is going to do this, North Korea is going to do that. They don't really know. All right? There's educated guesses. But let me tell you, that's the critical question that people are asking right now and one that we've been asking for the last 20 years. Is North Korea willing to give up its nuclear weapons and uh, uh, submit to what we call a verifiable regime, making sure that, in fact, they're willing to give these up? Okay? So... On one end of the spectrum, you have someone like John Bolton, who's the current NASA security advisor in Washington, D.C., working for Donald Trump, who says, no way, North Korea is not willing to give those up. They will never give those up. This is a waste of time. On the other hand, you have the president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, who's doing a lot with North Korea, as you know, who says, yes, absolutely, they're willing to give up these nuclear weapons. My answer to that is, I don't know. Okay? But... For the first time in over 10 years, we have the opportunity to talk with someone and the only person who matters in North Korea to find out, and that's Kim Jong-un, all right? So my point is, it is knowable. And because it's knowable, let's find out. Let's not assume. And that's why I'm applauding what the South Korean president is doing and what Donald Trump is doing, even though I disagree with Donald Trump on a lot of other issues. On North Korea, I agree what he's doing, because let's talk. And you know what? Not only talk, let's create a game plan or a plan in which North Korea will do something in exchange for us because I don't trust North Korea's words. What I trust are their actions. And so that is the way for us to find out. So in three or four years, I might be able to tell you, in fact, if that's the case or not. Right now, we don't know. Good question. I saw a hand in Frazier. Frazier, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Go ahead. What would a uh, United Korea look like for the West? I'm sorry? Say that one more time. What would a United Korea look like for the West? Mm, interesting. So uh, I don't, you know, it's, I think uh, United Korea is a long way from now, okay? So what you've got is in South Korea, in fact, um, there's a lot of different uh, uh, groups on the Korean Peninsula, both in North Korea and South Korea, in terms of what they want. In South Korea, you have older gener an older generation that wants to have unification at any cost. Some will say if it costs a war and there's six or seven million people who die, that's okay. You have other people who say that um, they want to do something in, in collaborative, and they don't trust those people, do not trust North Korea. Then you have the current government, which basically says they want to have some kind of confederation or reconciliation. And then you, and these people are now governing, they're in their probably 50s or 60s. And then you've got the younger people who don't care. They don't know, all right? Um, and in North Korea, I suspect you've got some people who are aching for unification, some who are not sure because they're going to, uh, it'll threaten their existence. So the long and short of it is, um, I don't think reunification is going to occur anytime soon, um, but I do think reconciliation can happen where both of these countries can start working together to help each other. And so uh, I, I also think that North Korea will have nuclear weapons um, for the short term and possibly the medium term. Um, you know, that's a long-winded answer of saying, you know, it, it really depends on both countries and what they want to start off with is try to figure out a way to cooperate and end the Korean War and try to have some reconciliation. I got another question. We have, we have one more question. We might even have two more questions. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay. Are there any active uh, nuclear weapons on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation? Did you hear that? Okay, so I'm, uh, you know, uh, you guys, do you know, do you guys know where Maelstrom is? Yes, Great Falls. Okay, Great Falls. So that's where most of those, their silos all around that area there. Okay. Yeah. 
That I, I couldn't tell you because I'm not really sure where that is. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to show you. So here is where Fraser is. Here's the Fort Peck Reservation. Yeah, and I... then here's, uh, there's Great Falls. Okay, I have a tendency to doubt it, but I, I don't, I couldn't say for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, though. Yeah. <laughs> did you have one, did you have one more, Fraser? Okay. No, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let's perfect. go ahead and move on, and then we'll we'll have more opportunities for questions in okay. a few minutes. Yep. So let me then go to the second section that we were talking about. Let me answer what is the real threat, and why is North Korea doing what it's doing? And we kind of talked a little bit about that. So what is the real danger? All right. I will tell you what the real danger is not. The real danger is not a preemptive nuclear strike by North Korea out of the blue. Do people understand what that is? I mean, North Korea just suddenly waking up and saying, I don't like the United States, I'm gonna blob a nuclear missile and hit them, all right? Um, a lot of people I've noticed over this past year, because of the up stepped up rhetoric, were really afraid of that, okay? And I'm here to tell you I'm not worried about that. Why? Because despite what you may hear, or what you might hear on the radio, or what you might hear on the news, North Korea, for all its idiosyncrasies, they're not crazy, they're not insane, they are rational. And the idea of deterrence, the idea that if you hit me, I will hit you, is alive and well on the Korean Peninsula. North Koreans are not insane. They are not crazy. They are not suicidal. They know if they did a bolt out of the blue and hit the United States, they would cease to exist. So I am not worried about a preemptive nuclear strike. All right? I'll tell you what I am worried about. I'm worried about mistake and miscalculation. Okay, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you have a Korean Peninsula right now that has, you know, you have these annual exercises, military exercises. Doing these military exercises, you have one million man army doing exercises on North Korean sides, one million troops. You have on the South Korean side something like 350 to 400,000 troops doing exercises. You have for uh, 30,000 U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula, and you have 50,000 troops in Japan doing all similar things. Now, what happens? What happens if a missile goes off course? The test that North Korea does. What happens if there is a firefight exchanged over the DMZ and someone gets killed? What happens if there is a firefight in the East or West Sea, east of, on the sea, east and west of the Korean Peninsula, where people are killed? Those have happened in the past, okay? So you have that kind of thing going on. Now, let's put it in the context of Donald Trump saying, fire and fury, you guys are going to be destroyed, we're going to take you out if you do this. North Korea threatening the same thing. You've got a young, a relatively young, inexperienced uh, leader in North Korea who uh, has a penchant for surprise and is very aggressive. I'd say that you could say the same thing about Donald Trump, and you put those two together, there's a possibility of mistake. Now think about this. Do you all guys remember what happened almost a year ago in Hawaii? Do you remember that? Okay, so for those of you who aren't aware, uh, in January, Hawaii, uh, the people in Hawaii suddenly got a text message on their phone. And what did it say? Ballistic missile incoming. Okay? Take cover. This is not a drill. Now, it was a mistake, but think about this. If, if fortunately, people found out it was a mistake, fortunately it was a state system, not a national system. Now think about this. What if North Korea, in the height of this tension, said, had heard about this over Twitter or your social media, <coughs> And they're thinking, we didn't do this. Is this an excuse for what the United States wants to do to attack us? Are they going to respond? <coughs> the U.S. protocol is that when they get a missile threat like this, the United States, most of you don't know, that the President of the United States has 10 minutes to decide whether to shoot one missile, no missiles, or a 1,000 missiles. And no one can stop him if, he's, if he believes he's under attack. The North Koreans know this, so they're thinking, is this a justification 
for doing something. So can you can imagine that you're playing this chess game of, you know, who's doing what here, and you're dealing it with nuclear missiles. Now, if there is even a small conflict that happens on the Korean Peninsula, let's exchange a fire, that can quickly escalate into possibly a nuclear war. And we talked about what the impact of that can be. Okay, so that is the meat, that is the short term, that that's what I was concerned about last year. All right? The medium term and longer term threat is North Korea is producing one nuclear weapons worth of material every eight weeks. Think about that. Every eight weeks. So in five or six years, instead of 25 to 30, they could have 75 to 100. Now, this nuclear material, once you produce it, you can't simply throw it away in the garbage can. The half-life, or in other words, this stuff it stays around for a very, very long time. Highly enriched uranium, which is stuff that goes boom, has a half-life in the millions of years. Plutonium, which is another way to nu make a nuclear uh, weapon, has a half-life of 24,000 years. So in other words, you can't throw it away. Once you've cut it done, you've got to secure it. So what happens when you, it's one thing to have one or two nuclear weapons worth of material, which they had maybe 10 years ago. Now they have 25 on their way to 100. And I guarantee you that material is not in one place. It is scattered all through North Korea. So what happens if North Korea collapses? What happens if sanctions actually work and you have somebody who's starving and I'm in charge of a piece of material? Now think about this. What we're talking about is something the size of a grapefruit that can level a small city. Think about it. How many people would pay a lot of money to get something like that? So once you produce that material, you've got a lot of people who are willing to pay a lot of money to do that. And if it gets out of North Korea, I guarantee you that's going to blow up somewhere in the United States, Western Europe, or the Middle East. All right? So that's the real threat. Okay? So finally, let me just talk about why is North Korea doing what it's doing. All right? And very quickly, this is how I describe it. The number one thing that North Korea wants, and this is my hypothesis, okay, is it wants the regime, the regime, and the people that want to survive. They want to stay in power. So how do they do that? In order to stay in power, they have to do three things. First, as, as, in, as you're in charge of the government, you have to be able to show your people you could protect the homeland, your country, and present your, prevent yourself from being intimidated by larger powers. That's the first thing you have to do. The second, so the second thing that you have to do is that you, the North Koreans have talked about them being a special people, being chosen. Okay, so they have to preserve that. And the third thing is that they have to give economic benefits of some kind. Those are the three things that they have to do to stay in power. I submit to you that nuclear weapons facilitates as a means to all three of them. And that's why North Korea having nuclear weapons is a very rational choice that people could understand. Why is that? North, nuclear weapons are the poor man's weapon. All right? If you don't have a lot of money, you can make sure that no one's going to attack you. If you say you attack us, we'll attack you. Deterrence. All right? And when I was in negotiations with North Korea, they kept on telling me the Slobodan Milosevic of Yugoslavia had had nuclear weapons. If Saddam Hussein of Iraq had had nuclear weapons, if Muammar Gaddafi of Libya had nuclear weapons, they'd still be in power. And you know what? They're right. All right? So that's one. Nuclear weapons... How many people know, how many countries do you think have nuclear weapons right now in the world? Anybody know? Soldatna, go for it. <laughs> how many is there? Uh, is it seven? It's seven, right? Uh, it's nine. Oh. Okay, because you have North Korea and Israel, Pakistan, India. Okay? Now, think about this. North Korea has them, South Korea doesn't. There are very few people who are part of the Nuclear Weapons Club who have that sophistication. North Korea can claim, and they have integrated into their national myth, the idea that they are special. Okay? So, the thing is, is that they are on par in their, in their internal sort of um, narrative, okay, on par with the United States, China, and Russia. They have to be treated as an equal. That boosts the regime and the support they have. And then finally, there's the notion that if they are secure, that they can protect themselves, they can then concentrate on economic development. And in fact, that is what the new leader, the grandson Kim Jong-un has said, that they're going to economics once they have the ability to protect themselves. And there's precedent for that. At the end of World War II, the United States said to the developing East Asian countries, 
don't worry about your security, we will protect you, concentrate on the economy, and then you had the emergence of Japan, South Korea, um, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, other countries. And in China itself, China in 1979 said, well, we have a nuclear deterrent, we can protect ourselves, and then they started funneling their resources into, uh, into, um, uh, into the economy, and lo and behold, you have the Chinese economic miracle. That's what the North Koreans are trying to do. So those are the three, re that is why North Korea wants to have a nuclear weapons program, and that's why, to me, it makes a lot of sense. So why don't we stop there, questions related to that. Absolutely. Let's see, who would like to start us off? Oh, I see a hand in Sealy. Go ahead, Sealy. Let's start. You can start us off. <laughs> uh, do you think North Korea uh, knows where a lot of the U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, places are? Uh, the short answer is they know a lot. Okay, so we have something like 15, 1,600 nuclear weapons, um, enough to blow the world up several times over. Uh, scattered throughout the world. Um, the only places they know for sure are the ones that are on the land-based missiles. <laughs> so they know where all 150 of the silos are in Montana, uh, Nebraska, I believe, Colorado, and, uh, and one of the Dakotas, okay? So they know that. Um, nuclear weapons are also on bombers, and some of them are located in uh, Minot, uh, and some of them are in Barksdale. And then we have a whole bunch of them on submarines that are basically tr uh, patrolling all over the world. Uh, and the reason that's good is to the notion of what we call a second strike. So the idea is that if you hit me, okay, I guarantee you I'm going to be able to hit you back because submarines, you don't know where they are. So that's the whole notion of deterrence, okay? So the short answer is they know where some of them are. Um, but, you know, they don't have to know, they don't have to take out our nuclear weapons per se. Their reason they have those weapons is that they know that we don't want to be hit. And so they know that if we hit them or do something, we will, that they will respond back, and that's the idea of deterrence. One more question from Seeley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one. Um, if you think that North Korea was to send an, a, a bomb like over to the U.S. other than um, D.C., where do you think they would send it? Well, they'd probably do it to the closest place they could send it, quite frankly. So it would probably be on the West Coast. Um, it would probably be Alaska. It could be Washington State, right? Again, it's not going to be that precise. It doesn't really matter. I mean, if you know that you can hit the United States, um, that is going to be deterrence in and of itself. And as I said, I don't think they're going to do that unless um, they feel that they're threatened or they are attacked first. Yeah. Frazier, go ahead. How accurate is the U.S. anti-missile system located in South Korea? I'm sorry, one more time? You, cut, you guys cut out just a tiny bit on, the, on it. Could you say that one more time? <laughs> You said, how accurate is the U.S. anti-missile system located in uh, South Korea? Is it an effective nuclear deterrent? Uh, well, no. Um, so there are three kinds of missile defenses, okay? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, that's a great question because I think a lot of people are being misled, all right? Um, so there are th so several kinds of missile systems. Patriot, which is a small area. Then you have THAAD, which is sort of a larger area. Uh, uh, and then you have um, the Aegis system, which is part of the ocean, and then you have ground-based missiles, okay, which are located in Alaska and, and um, uh, uh, California. Um, so the, the short of this is that politically, um, South Korea agreed to have them because it makes everyone feel better. But the point is, is that these missile batteries are very small, they're not very, they're, they're few in number. And what we call is that any missile defense, particularly the Patriot system and these others, can be overwhelmed. So in other words, if you shoot enough missiles, they're not going to be able to have a 100% hit rate. And so if one gets through, it doesn't really make a difference, okay? 
So, uh, you know, even if missile defense works as it is advertised, and I would say that the evidence is very spotty. In fact, it hasn't worked as advertised. They haven't been uh, tested in real, uh, under real uh, life conditions. They've been tested under conditions to make sure they succeed. And even then, the rate has been 50 percent. Uh, the whole notion of what North Korea, remember during, the, during last year when they, were all, they had all these missile tests that were going on, remember all of them? A lot of those were to demonstrate, in, in fact, there were several in which they shot six or seven in a row in a very tight space. The messaging to North Korea, and again, this is evidence that North Korea is sending a message, they know what they're doing. They're basically saying to the United States, the Japanese and the South Koreans, yeah, you've got missile defense, but we can overwhelm it and we can do it very accurately. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, and in fact, what I would say is it's destabilizing, not stabilizing and not really deterrence because the whole idea is that if you think you can prevent anyone from hitting you, um, that's going to increase the incentive for people to use them, okay? Uh, Alaska, do you have any questions? Hi, I'm Bum. So, do you believe North Korea is using their nukes as more of a shield instead of a sword at the moment? Yes, I think that's part of what they're doing. They're using it as a shield. I think that's the security aspects of it, so to protect themselves. But I also think they're using it as a sword in order to extract benefits or get the United States and others to pay attention to them. If, the, if North Korea did not have nuclear weapons, we would probably ignore them most of the time. All right. The fact that they do have nuclear weapons, they are able to extract benefits from us. And that is a pattern that has been created uh, over the last 25 years. And what we're trying to do with the current policy is get away from that dynamic. So it is both a shield, but it's also a sword in the sense that they're not going to attack us, but they want to extract some kind of benefits as a result. I'm going to come in and... and Ask a question of you as sure. well as just recap a couple of things for mm -hmm. the students. So nuclear weapons are scary, and they're a big deal, right? It's important to understand what's going on with them and what's happening. And I think we all know a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things that we've talked about today is that nuclear weapons um, right now with North Korea, if you imagine, and correct me if this analogy mm -hmm. is not right, um, but for our Montana and our Alaska students, um, imagine, let's go with elk, right, during the rut. They do a lot of posturing with their antlers. They'll come up to one another, they'll kind of strut around, they'll show their antlers off, but a lot of times they're not going to engage, or if they do, it's very minimal, because they don't want to hurt each other. Um, they just want to show the other, the other bull elk that they have some, that they have some power. So. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what North Korea is doing right now. I've got some power. I'm trying to show you that I want to be taken seriously. Um, and then the third thing that I want to reiterate is that what you're doing right now with Plowshare um, is actually trying to help diffuse some of these right. issues. And would you speak a little bit to that? And okay. let's, let's move the conversation in that direction. So what we're doing at Plowshares Fund is um, trying to educate people uh, part of what we're doing here, right here, because a lot of people think, still in the United States, that North Korea is actively, you know, wants to actually hit the United States preemptively, which is not true. I think there's some still a lot of debate whether, in fact, North Korea has the capability of being able to hit the United States. But even if it were true, there's no reason why North Korea would want to. So this is a myth out there that we're trying to dispel, trying to educate people about. One of the things that we're also trying to do is educate people as to what really the stakes are and what the real dangers are. Um, you know, one thing that people we had talked about here, as I said before, people think if sanctions work, right, North Korea will submit and everything will be hunky-dory. That's not necessarily true. If sanctions actually work, you're at, you know, my argument is, well, you know, they may give up or they may submit, but there's also an added incentive that they're actually going to sell this nuclear material in order to, you know, to protect their individual families, right? So part of what we're doing is organizing. We're trying to get young people, we're trying to get all these people to tell um, their government officials that, you know, we care about what goes on in North Korea uh, for a variety of reasons, okay? 
And the last thing that you want to have is another war, because if you have a war, as it could easily escalate into something much bigger, and that's what we do. So, again, we work with grassroots organizations, we help with analysis, uh, and give it to some universities. The other thing that we do also is to the extent that you see and hear people in the news, whether it's on, um, you know, live on television or uh, radio or in print, you know, in op-eds and articles, chances are that we funded a lot of this stuff as well. And we did that with respect to the Iran deal, um, which was uh, signed uh, a couple of years ago, which unfortunately President Trump has withdrawn from, which personally I think is, like, was a huge mistake, but we'll see what happens with that. Okay. All right. Let's go with one last round of questions. We have time for um, maybe each school two questions. Okay, I see the hand in Sealy. Go ahead. Uh, um, like, are, do you get to see the like the outskirts of like uh, in North Korea, like of the big cities where like was it really poverty? Like, was there a lot of poverty? Okay, so I've been to North Korea. So just to let you know, background: I've been was involved in a lot of senior nego a lot of negotiations with the U.S. government with North Korea. I've been to North Korea um, five times, and I've actually met the father, Kim Jong Il. All right, mm -hmm. so I've been to Pyongyang several times, and when I went to Pyongyang, one of the times was through the DMZ. I was one of the first people who actually. Uh, went to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, actually walked over the line and then went all the way to Pyongyang to North Korea. So Pyongyang itself is, uh, North Korea is sort of like an elephant. It depends what part of the animal, what part of what you see. Some of it is incredibly poor, some of it is quite prosperous, okay? And the center, which is Pyongyang, the capital city, is an impressive city. It's meant to impress. So when you go there, when you go to Washington, um, and I think most, a lot of you probably have, when you go to Washington, D.C., it's a monument city. It's meant to impress. Pyongyang is very similar to that. And that center, that area, is relatively prosperous. People have got cell phones. Um, there are, when I was there, um, and it's been a while now, almost 15 years since I've been there, but while I was there, there were some, uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of bicycles, um, a lot of cars, but now, you know, ca there are a lot of cars. So there is... Despite what you hear about the sanctions, the city and that, that part of the country is actually showing steady improvement. And in fact, that's all North Korea government has to show is a steady improvement. So, um, you know, but there are other parts of North Korea that are very, very poor. Uh, a whole generation of individuals in North Korea, young people, are malnourished. They have food insecurity, and that is going to affect their development. When you go to North Korea, and, you know, North Koreans and South Koreans are the same people genetically. But when you go to North Korea, the thing that you notice is that many North Koreans, many of them, are a good four, five, six inches shorter than the average South Korean. And that's all because of nutrition. Wow. Interesting. All right, I saw one more hand in Sealy, and then we're going to move to Fraser after that, and then Soldatna. Um, what do you think the future between North Korea and the U.S. is? Well, I, for right now, again, I'm really glad that we're not in the fire and fury stage. You know, Donald Trump, you know, I'm in love with Kim Jong-un. You know, that's, that's another thing. I think right now um, there's a lot of conversation that's going on. My fear is that uh, for a variety of reasons they're going to get stuck on who goes first. The, the debate right now is... Do you, North Korea wants sanctions um, and end of the war or some kind of peace treaty before they will denuclearize. The United States wants, you to, wants North Korea to denuclearize before they give those things up. So it's a question that, and in some ways we're reverting back to the old formula as who goes first. If we spend too much time with that, I'm afraid that the opportunity to actually figure out what North Korea is willing to do is going to be will disappear. So there are two, op two possibilities then what happens is we revert back to where North Korea, the United States then starts putting more and more pressure on North Korea and we start to get an escalation. There's a new factor here and that is South Korea. The South Korean and the President Moon Jae-in is trying to move as fast as possible with the opening that exists to try to uh, make sure that <coughs> that it, uh, uh, tensions between on the Korean Peninsula still remain relatively low. And so, 
what we have here is a situation where North, the United States is kind of playing bad cop. <coughs> South Korea is playing good cop. That works if you're coordinated. My concern is that it's not coordinated. And therefore, what may happen is that there's going to be increasing tension, not only between the United States and North Korea, but the United States and South Korea. And if that happens, that's bad news for all of us, because North Korea will take advantage of that, uh, that, uh, dif those differences. Yep. Frazier, did you have a question for, for us? Yes, go ahead. Where does uh, stand on North, North Korea's nuclear weapons? So, where does NATO stand on North Korea's nuclear weapons? So uh, they are completely in line with uh, the rest of the international community. They want North Korea to give them up. They're part of, you know, most of those countries in NATO are part of the UN, and we have a number of sanctions which are calling for North Korea to give those weapons up, uh, to stop the missile tests, uh, to do no more missiles. They're they're illegal, et cetera, et cetera. So they're very much in line with the uh, South Korean and the United States in terms of trying, telling them that they should not have them. Good question. Frazier, do you have another one? No, thank you. We're good. All right. Soldatna, do you have a question? You're good. Um, if there was to be, like, if North Korea was to shoot a missile at us, where do you think they'd hit? Like, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California? You said West Probably. Coast. Probably. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the easiest because it's shorter, right? But again, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I wouldn't really worry about that. <clears throat> okay, wait, let me say it. The only time I would worry about something like that is if we press North Korea so hard that they think we're going to attack them. Okay? Yeah. All right, one more question, Soldatna. Go ahead. So, hi, um, so... So it's not necessarily related to um, missiles or nukes, but I, I was wondering because it's kind of a problem we have in the United States where um, poor, uh, a poor economy is, there's a lot of, since because of the poor economy in Mexico, there's a lot of people trying to cross the border from Mexico to America or U, the US. Is that a problem from North Korea to South Korea? Uh, or is <laughs> Well, I think what you're describing is more of a problem or a situation in China. Because China and North Korea share a relatively large border, um, there, is, there are a lot of Korean North Korean refugees who go into China for economic reasons. And so the interesting thing is for the longest time, they used to go into China, make some money, and come back again. So they go back and forth on that. Um, and so one of the things that China is worried about, and one of the reasons why they are um, supporting or are more or less support North Korea is that they don't want North Korea, the North, North Korea to collapse because what they're afraid of is if North Korea collapses, um, two things. One is that there are a bunch of refugees that will come into China and China is worried about security of its northern province because there have been disputes as to there are more ethnic Koreans in there than there's a, there's a uh, concern that they will want to then be annexed to South Korea. So that's you know unlikely, but that's one concern. And there's always been some historical dispute. The other thing is that, you know, remember, the Korean War was fought. Uh, and the reason why the Chinese went into North Korea was to prevent US troops from going along the, the Chinese border. And so that's another reason why uh, China is doing what they can do to prop up or to support um, North Korea. Um, North Koreans don't like the Chinese. The Chinese don't like the North Koreans. The North Koreans are saying the only reason you're supporting us is because China, it's in your interest, China, to support us. That's all. It's not because you like us. Good question. So I'd like to end on, on a question. What can we do and what can students do? What as we're... Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I would suggest for you to do is I, I think the best thing first is to get, um, get informed about what the situation is. All right. There are a lot of resources on nuclear weapons, how many they are, what they're, what, you know, why, why they're a liability as opposed to an asset. I mean, you could debate that in your class. You know, there's some people who think we should still have them and have a conversation about that. I also want you to think, and what's really important is in any kind, you know, in this globalized world, it's really important to understand 
your adversary. It's important to understand who's on the other side of the table that you're negotiating with or you're trying to work out a problem with. And so it's your responsibility, in a sense, to understand um, your, the, your adversary and all the baggage they bring. So here is not to be taken in by the stereotypes that I think exist there that are perpetuated by various media groups, okay, on both sides of the spectrum here. So it's your duty to get really informed. And then finally, I think what's really important is to let people who you see in your government, in your, you know, all of, you know, the, your elected representatives, uh, people in Washington, um, to really care, you know, let them know that you're holding them accountable for any decision they make. I mean, 20 years ago, no one cared about North Korea, right? And it was politically feasible to keep on bashing North Korea. I'm not, uh, you know, trying to protect North Korea, but what I am worried about is that there cannot be another war on, North, in, on the Korean Peninsula. That would just be absolutely devastating. So we have to figure out accountability. And then finally, what I would say for all of you, what you can be doing is getting involved to the extent that there are organizations that are trying to do stuff that helps open up North Korea. Because the more they see, the more they open up, the better it is, I think, in the long term for all of us. And so there are going to be opportunities, in a sense, to you know, um, you know, host people or to go to China. You know, those kinds of things that you, prevent, you promote people-to-people -people contact and all of that you can be involved with as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for okay. um, coming today. Can you uh, join me in just thanking? Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.